Hey, tipsters, how's it going? You are listening to the RE Tipster podcast. This is episode 134. Show notes for today's episode can be found at retipster.com forward slash 134. And uh, this is your buddy, Seth, and uh, I'm coming to you with a true story today about crime, deception, identity fraud, money laundering, and a lot more. This all started back in May of this year when I saw somebody post an article in our Facebook group about identity thieves using fraudulent deeds to steal people's property in Florida. And when I first saw this, I kind of just wanted to like brush it off as some random thing that almost never happens. But then I saw somebody else post another article about separate incidents about how another couple in Florida was arrested for stealing 67 Florida homes. And then I heard from another person in this same thread, a guy named Eloy Ochoa, who left a comment saying that a similar scam almost happened to him in Southwest Florida just recently. And that when I started hearing story after story of this happening, and when I saw there was somebody in our community who had firsthand experience with this, kind of started feeling like I needed to investigate this further. So I reached out to Eloy and he was happy to do a recorded call with me. And that's what you're about to hear in this episode today. Now, before we jump into it, let me just say right from the outset that there actually is good news at the end of the day. And we're going to get into all that at the very end of this episode after we play the recorded interview here. So as you're listening to this, if you start to feel a little bit of anxiety, just know that's totally not my intent with this episode. In fact, that's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Mainly what I want to do here is just make people aware that uh, this is apparently a thing. And this is actually the first time I have ever heard of this in my 15 years in the real estate world as both a banker and a land investor and a rental property owner. So, like, I don't think this is a common thing, at least not historically, but it is still a thing. And it's worth being aware of because I wasn't really aware of it up until just recently. And I wanted to make sure everybody else out there in the land community knew about it. Not because it's common or it's something you need to lose sleep over, but just because it pays to be smart about what can happen and how to spot red flags and different things that you can do to protect yourself. There actually has been an arrest made in connection with this story that I'm going to be talking about with Eloy. And we didn't even know about this until a couple of weeks after we recorded this interview. So that's just something to be aware of. And again, I'm going to get into a lot more specifics about that after the interview and the closing comments for this episode. But for now, you can hear what happened and um, how it all unfolded. Why don't you just tell the whole story from the very beginning? What, what happened? What went down here? It's kind of crazy. So basically, I bought a, like a vacant lot in Lehigh Acres, Florida, right? And, you know, I bought it, you know, cash is going to flip it for like double the money, your kind of method. And when I start trying to sell it, I get a call, like a random call from my actual seller's phone number. So, you know, you know, you have a buyer and seller's phone number from Ring Central. I'm like, how did this guy get my number? Because he's like, hey, are you selling a lot in Lehigh Acres? And it kind of shocked me because there's no way he got that number. So the way he got my number is he's a very seasoned buyer. Uh, vacant lots in the area so he found my company he found my website he found my number and he got a hold of me he's like hey um are you selling this property i'm like yeah i've already sold it at the time i was already on contract waiting for the s road to go through and he's like no this other guy's selling it i'm like what what do you mean no this other guy named eloy selling it i'm like i'm eloy he, well, he sent me a contract i'm like there's no way so i started getting scared so before then when I was still trying to sell it, I actually contacted the neighbors. I only live an hour away. So I actually knocked on the neighbor's door and asked her, hey, I'm selling this lot. She wasn't interested, but she, I gave her my information. So after he calls me, like me a couple of days later, this lady, the next door neighbor, she's like, hey, did you sell the lot? I'm like, yeah, I'm in the process of it. Well, somebody just cleared it. I'm like, wait, how did they clear? I'm, I still own the property. I, I, I haven't done anything. You mean like cut trees down? They cut the trees down because in Lehigh Acres, like a lot of trees and brush and stuff, and they completely leveled it to the ground. So I'm like, okay, as soon as I could, that same day, I went and drove to the property and she was right. They cleared it completely. I thought she was talking about the lot next door. I'm like, nope, she cleared it completely. I was like, so do you know who did this? She said, there's Argentinian couple 
um, bought the vacant lot. I'm like, there's no way. There's like no way. And she's like, yeah, they had a baby and everything. And I was confused. So I go back and call the guy. He's like, do you have any information on this person who sold you this law? Do you have any D, like any contracts, anything with you? He's like, no, I was going to sign it, but I wanted to get in contact with you first. So I started getting kind of scared. He said that he saw it on Zillow. I'm like, how do you see on Zillow? I didn't post it on Zillow. The scammers actually put it for sale by owner on Zillow because you don't need any kind of verification at all. So he put it on for sale by owner on Zillow. They call you though, right? Doesn't Zillow have to call you? But they probably, you probably just put whatever number you want in there, right? Yeah, you could, you could. There's no any kind of checks and balances there. So I was scared because I was trying to remove the listing. They put it at three thousand dollars. The market rate is fifteen thousand at the time in that specific area. And I was like, there's no way. And it goes getting higher and higher, the view count. I'm like, I was getting more stressed because I actually put a sign there. They removed the sign completely. So I went, rushed to Home Depot, put another sign. My rationale was if I put a sign there, the number they have is going to be different from the number that they got contacted by the scammer from. And they might contact me just, just to verify because it looks weird. And it happened. I'm starting getting calls from all these different people that were saying, hey, are you selling this property? Because somebody else is selling me. I have to say like at least eight, nine times and say, no, do not do anything with those people. And then I got in contact with some of them that actually got contracts. So they actually got the purchase agreement, which is very, very professional. It was a very professional purchase agreement. They got the purchase agreement and they use like a document sign kind of portal. But the crazy thing is they had the IP address on the very bottom. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to have to make a police report. And there's a big problem making police reports with online fraud. It's very difficult because I live in another county. I told one of the potential victims, she hasn't sold it yet. I told him, give me everything that they sent you. So she sent me the purchase agreement, the phone numbers they were using, the emails they were using, and then the title company they were going to use. I'm like, which title company is going to do this? Yeah. And then they have a website with a title company. So I did a little bit of research on the title company. So I called my title company to see, to verify they actually work in the area. Their website was extremely professional. It looked better than actual title companies' websites. And I'm like, this is easy. People can fall for the scam, you know, very easily. But then the major thing that has been a red flag for most, you know, seasoned investors is that the title company was asking, let's say the purchase price was $3,000. They're asking escrow for $3,000. That doesn't make any sense. You're going to put escrow for the full amount? You mean like a deposit? Yeah, the deposit, earning money deposit. Yeah. And I was confused. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you put the full purchase amount as an EMD? And they were like, yeah, that's why I thought it was weird because I saw your number. And I never got to be able to get in contact with the Argentinian couple that bought the, the clear the lot, unfortunately. But um, I got in contact with a whole bunch of different potential victims. I stopped them before um, they sold it. And then I got another call from this other lady. It's like, oh, they put it for sellbyowner.com. So not only they were putting it on Zillow, any website that gives you the ability to post it online, they were calling them. And then even on Facebook groups. So they're using multiple different Facebook accounts. And then I finally got the phone number and started texting the guy from a different number, like a fake you know, Google voice number. So I start talking to him. I'm like, hey, I hear that you're selling some lots in Lehigh Acres. I'm like, yeah, sure, I am. And supposedly it was my wife because he was sending sending purchase agreements and signing them with my name through DocuSign. So I was getting very scared because now I asked him, are you selling any more lots? Because at the time, when he, I only owned one lot in the area. It's like, yeah, we do. He gave me a list of five different lots that I didn't even own. Some of them were merged with other houses. So like legally, they weren't even lots anymore. They were merged. So it was like a completely different thing. So I was, I was like, these people are, are using my name to sign off on properties that I own and I don't own. And I got really scared, honestly, because I'm like, it's going to come back at me. Well, it sounds like just your, um, I guess, I don't want to say typical, but it sounds like just identity fraud, right? It's just that they're using it in this case, not to like buy a car or use a credit card, but like to actually sell real estate on your behalf and collect money. Yeah, but they weren't actually even doing the deeds or anything. They were just making purchase agreements, signing with my name. The purchase agreements were very professional. The people who did this, 
I have a really good hunch. They, they've done a lot of real estate in the past. The purchase agreements were very professional. The title company website was very professional. They even put a building, the building they put on the, for the title company was something that's under construction, like that was being renovated. So even if you Google map it, you're not going to be able to like actually see the building because it was being renovated at the time. So they, if it just kind of recap to make sure I'm following you. So they weren't actually transferring any deeds to anybody. They were just collecting 3000 bucks from multiple people on the same property using your name. Is that right? Yes. For the same properties or other different properties as well. Because they, they have a title company that they made a little legitimate and they had an other person answering the phone with the title company. I actually got the wiring information from one of the banks they were using. So before all, when this started happening, I called an attorney friend of mine to see like, what are my options? Like, what can I do? And he's like, how do they even have a bank account? Because this is obvious fraud, right? And he said, you know, those Facebook link that people tell you, oh, you can make $5,000 in a week. Those links are basically to make the person make a fake bank account. They'll have access to it. They'll give you five grand, but your information is in that bank account, but you have full access to it. So they could wire the money to different bank accounts overseas and you're pretty much done. You can't get that money back. So if they go, the law goes for the person who has a bank account is a person who got the $5,000 to set it up. So I had the bank account information. I had the IP address. I had multiple different phone numbers from them. The problem is, is the jurisdiction. I made a police report in my local county, but I was only a victim of identity theft. The other people were victims of almost becoming like in fraud. I made a police report in my county. I had to make a police report in Lee County where the property is located. But because I was an victim, I couldn't really make the police report on there because they're basically telling me, oh, they got to make a police report here, your county, you know, vice versa. They're just basically telling me to go make police reports. And my lawyer friend, he told me, you need to get in contact with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And then as soon as I told them, they were right on it. Like I gave them all their information. Um, I still haven't heard back from them yet, but it's still like an ongoing case. But it was crazy. And the other thing is, I actually started contacting them, right? I messaged them, like, hey, do you sell them properties? And then I'm like, can I get a hold of the owner? Because obviously my name was like, no, this is his wife. So supposedly I have a wife now. And then he's, uh, well, no problem. When can I speak with him? Well, he speaks French. I'm like, so I'm speaking French now. <laughs> like, well, I, I could go over there and sign the deed myself. You know, no problem. I'm actually going to Miami anyways. He's like, no, no, it's just better if you just wire us the information, the money. I'm like, no, no, I, I kind of like want to see if I'm buying a lot of property. I want to see the person. No, no, he's busy. He's very busy. So I was kind of trolling the scammer a little bit because he was just wanted the money. Like he just deposited the money. They're going to, they're going to sell fast. They're going to sell fast. Deposit the money, typical scammer stuff. So I got a lot of takeaways on how to avoid those kind of things. So the best ways to avoid is first, you got to put a sign on the property. Even if you have to do an upwork or something or task rabbit, put a sign on the property when you own it, put it on Zillow, put it on for sale by owner.com. Even if you're not going to really use those resources, because if you put it on Facebook or anything, they're going to get the information from the Facebook page and then start putting it on, on those websites. It's almost kind of like uh, buying a, a internet domain. Even if you're not going to use it, at least you own that domain, right? Other people can step on your toes. But yeah, exactly. And another thing is you have to make sure you know who your buyers are on Facebook. Because before all this happened, there's a person who originally wanted to buy it. They hit me up. I posted on Facebook first, my biggest mistake, because I put all my information on there. I put it on Facebook first, and some woman was interested in buying it. Didn't even want to negotiate. I was still kind of early on, because that should have been a red flag already. Didn't even want to negotiate. Like, we'll buy it, but we have to use our title company. So I called them, I called the title company they recommended. It was a virtual title company. The way they work was it basically just have virtual offices, and they'll just do it themselves. And I called the title company, you know, everything looks good. And then I started calling them like a week later, doesn't pick up. I call the lady, she doesn't pick up. And another week goes by, call her again. And she's like, I'm in the hospital now. Big red flag right there. When everybody is in the hospital, there's a big red flag. And then I think it was a fake account because they obviously they blocked it. They blocked their account, their Facebook account, they deleted it. And then when I called the title company, it's gone. The line was disconnected. I think they were using, calling me to get the information they needed for me to sell my property because they did it too perfectly. 
And unfortunately, there was a victim that actually called me. She called me before when she was like a potential victim. And she didn't believe me. She believed other people more. Even though I told them, don't buy it. Do not buy it from these people. She wanted to go buy it. And then she goes back with me and says, hey, um, can I get on this police report now? Because I actually bought it. And now I'm out of $3,000. And then I give her the information for the, the agent of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And <laughs> unfortunately, she did. I know there's at least two victims. So they got at least 6,000. I'm pretty sure there's more. So the people who cleared the land, who was that? That was one of the people who thought they bought it and they just yeah. went ahead? Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about how you were just a victim of identity theft, but these other people were bigger victims, I guess, of losing their money. So it sounds like there's two sides of it. Like both you as the seller need to be aware that this stuff could happen out there. I mean, I've literally never heard of it until a couple of weeks ago when all of a sudden I see articles posted about it on Facebook. And then you chimed in and you were talking about how you had experience with this. So maybe it's a bigger issue than I thought it was, but... It is a big issue here in Southwest Florida. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, what is it about Florida that's uh, making people do that? It's a really hot market and there's lots. There's not that much due diligence on lots compared to, you know, obviously a home. They're easily be transferable. It's like a very liquid asset. So I think it's ripe with fraud because they're not going to do as much due diligence on a vacant lot because these builders and buyers are buying them in droves, $15,000 here, $15,000 there, and they're building homes. And it's easy. And one of the, I think the biggest issues, recording offices in counties, they don't do any due diligence. So I call the recording office because this is like a different situation. Somebody else recorded it incorrectly and put my legal description for my property, they don't double check it. So they could be two different owners and then they record it. They just see it as is and record it, right? Well, wait, so back up just a second. So you were saying, so somebody did try to record the deed for this property? Oh, this is a different situation. Different situation. Different situation. Okay. Yeah, but it, it comes into the, your topic that somebody recorded incorrectly and it was my property. And because people are doing so much volume, they're not really checking. So I had to get a lawyer and fix it. But was that just like an honest mistake on their end or were they trying to scam you? That was an honest mistake on their end. Okay, gotcha. On their end was an honest mistake, but there's scammers. In Cape Coral, this guy, he got like, I think like $300,000 just making fake deeds and recording them. So it, it is happening. Some of the articles that, uh, that I saw on this, they didn't do a great job of really explaining what was going on. I don't know if the people writing the article even really understood the issue, but from what I gathered, it sounded like that's what was happening. Is It wasn't just people collecting 3000 bucks and not doing a deed. It was like people were actually making up fake deeds. It's kind of mind blowing when you start to think about like how much damage a person could do if they knew how to game the system. I don't know. It, it's bothering me. I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer here. I don't know how you really protect yourself from every possible scam that could happen here. Is there some kind of like a notification system you can set up to be aware of? You can. In some counties, especially over here in Southwest Florida, because it's such a problem, you could put like a notification, you put your email or I'm not sure if you could put your phone number, but you could put your email. And then if anything changes with the deed, you get a notification automatically, which I think is a really good system to use. And you, you do this with the, at the county level or something or where do you at the do county, it? In the county website, like in Lee County, they have one. I'm not sure if Charlotte County over here in Southwest Florida, if you're familiar with it, Lee County has a lot of volume transactions because a lot of people are moving down here. So, you know, deeds move back and forth, sometimes multiple times within the year because people are just flipping them. So a lot of people, they don't even do their due because they only look at the legal description. So even if it has the wrong address that doesn't match the legal description, they're only going to go off the legal description. Like you said, they only care about the format and legal description. The only two things they care about because they have so much volume to record. I could just imagine how long it will take them to record, record it to verify every single notary on there, like especially in areas with high volume, maybe like in Colorado in the middle of nowhere, that could be done. But also there are very understaffed and underpaid. I think that's one of the reasons this is such an issue. I wish there could be like a solution to this because I'm in the same boat because I was scared to get lawsuits from other people, even though I wasn't even associated with it. Because we're signing deeds, I'm signing um, purchase agreements using my name. And in the state of Florida, you can even give my address too, because it's public information. Yeah, I mean, even if there was no legal recourse against you, um, there's still like tarnished reputation. You know, your name's associated with all this, all this fraudulent stuff that you didn't do. And it's, am I right in my thinking that 
this kind of thing would be much more common on really cheap low end properties. Like if somebody's buying a five hundred thousand dollar piece of land or house or whatever, I mean at that point, I mean it's a no brainer that first of all a title company is involved. And I know you're there's this whole thing about fake title companies, which kind of blows my mind that people would go through that much trouble to do that and do a good job of it. But just trying to think of like both from your end and also any buyer out there who might be listening to this, like what can everybody do to be smart about this and make sure they're not getting fooled by somebody? Yeah. Like those people had a pretty good scam. I'm not going to lie. They made a fake title company. The purchase agreements were on point. Their communication, at least in the beginning was very, very good. You know, the reply, um, I think you have to verify the owner in step one. And the way I do that is if I have their phone number, I'm going to white pages or truepeoplesearch.com and verifying their phone number matches the person. If they don't match, I'm going to start asking questions, especially like in those lower volume lots. For people who do this for a, you know, a living, that's not a, a problem, right? But people who are buying it to build their home, most people only do like two tra- real estate transactions in their lifetime. Like why would they know? You know? It's like, yeah, why would they know? Well, you don't have experience. Yeah. So, but if I was a buyer, the tip I would give is always verify the number with like white pages or truepeoplesearch.com. Make sure you use your own title company, even if you have to pay the closing cost, just to have the peace of mind because your title company is a very impartial person. They only care about getting the deal through. And if it doesn't pass their smell test, they're not going to do it because they don't want to get that hit of the title insurance. So use a title company that you're comfortable with, that you know, even if you have to pay for it, verify the phone number matches the number, the, the person on the deed. Make sure the person you're talking to matches the person on the like in Lee County specifically. You can easily find the person on the deed. They have really good records. You could check the records department, you know, verify, like let's say the, the person say they're John, John Smith, and then the person on the deed is Nancy Drew. There's a big disconnection right there. You got to figure out why is there. Um, that's the problem. I hate to like overcomplicate this even further, but like even if you were to find a real legitimate notary who did everything right. Like I just got something, notar- two things, two D's notarized today. And, you know, the notary asked for my driver's license to verify that I am who I say I am. What if I had a fake driver's license? It's like, there's so many different ways you could like screw with this system that is currently in place that we're all relying on for these huge transactions. I think about like a credit card fraud, you know, like it used to be a huge thing. And uh, I, I'm not an expert on this. I, I don't know. All I can say is like, from my experience, taking credit card payments for some of the stuff we have sold through RE Tipster. Back when we started doing this in 2015, it was like, man, it seemed like a once a month or once every other month, some kind of uh, payment would get like rejected because of credit card fraud or something. But once these uh, chips became a thing in credit cards, I don't know if that's the reason why fraud has gone down so much, but we like almost never get those kind of rejected payments anymore. And I've heard people talking about how Real estate title recording should be going the way of blockchain because it's a much more, um, you know, everything about blockchain, how that works. I don't know much, but like I actually thought about that as well. Like, but then the problem is, um, let's say you have it on something like you have to have like a key or something to access. Most people lose their deeds, right? You have to get like another deed from the county recorder. That's the only issue that you have. If you have to have something physically on you or something that could verify that it's yours, if you forget your password or you lose a deed, how can you? you know, move the property. You know, that's the only, I think, drawback from something that, I guess, blockchain associated with it. Because I kind of know where you're going because I thought about that too. Because after this experience, it's so easy to do fraud here. It's like super easy. There's no like really checks or balances at all. And I think this system, I mean, I guess I don't know for sure, but the other countries I'm aware of have a similar system, you know, where it's really just a piece of paper that you're getting signatures on and People trust it and they record it. And it's just a PDF sitting in some database now. And I mean, I've never thought about it, but uh, now that I hear about this, it's like, man, it's like if I was really a scammer, like there's so many opportunities to exploit this system. It's really kind of messed up that we're still doing it this way. Yeah. You don't even have to be really charismatic at all because most people like, I've never even been to a closing before. I've done all my real estate transactions online. So like now is even easier than ever because back in the day, probably only scam your local market, you know, before the internet. And then if you scam your local market, you can get caught real quick. People could be out of state and do this now. And then, you know, the notaries in it, right? Let's say they're a bad actor. It's not that hard to get a notary license. 
you could get somebody to do it, but you know they're they're the ones gonna get the heat if something happens. Yeah, it's true though. I mean, it takes very little to do that. I mean, you just you just really ask for it, you know. <laughs> and there is a bond you have to pay for is that supposed to kick in if you ever are sued or something like that. But it's not for like millions. I mean, it's like a, a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree. It's there's really not a very ironclad way to keep everybody accountable and make sure fraud doesn't happen. And with this new world we're living in, it seems like an overhaul is kind of needed. But no, it really is. How's that um, going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how they would do it. I even followed up yesterday just for this podcast, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, to see if there's any like feedback or anything. They haven't really messaged me back. So it's like it's still like a pending case. And it's very like scary because, like I said before, my name's on those contracts and they're signing them off to all these different people. And then they're using different addresses too. They're used a random address in Tampa. And then another contract, they use a random address in Miami. Even their their wire information has a different address as well. It's supposed to be a business, but the wire information is from a house. So you just got to verify everything. Yeah. Have you talked to any attorneys about just the situation? Like, do they have any recommendations on? It's a very specific case. I called um, my friend who's an attorney and he didn't even know who to recommend me to because that's very, like, you're only a victim of fraud, but the other people are the actual victims. I know of at least $6,000 $6,000 they got scammed. I'm pretty sure there's more. It has to be more because I only got a small percentage of those people. Yeah. Well, and you think about it. I mean, in this situation, certainly they were the victims, but like, what if somebody had forged your name and got a fake notary signature and, and deeded your, then you would be the victim. You just got your property stolen from you. And it sounds like that's actually happening with some people. It's not what your situation is luckily, but in that kind of thing, I mean, I'm sure that can be cleaned up. It's just a major hassle and people are going to get burned in the process because they're going to realize, oh, I bought something that isn't actually mine. But it'd be interesting to see how a court would handle that, you know? Yeah, I, I think the only way, like you said, the blockchain, if you make the notary have like a special key or situation that when they put their stamp of approval, it's going to go back to them immediately. And I think making the notary process a little bit more difficult or having a little bit more checks and balances is going to help with those deed situations for sure. Because it's going to come back to them eventually. You can't, it's something you can't fake. So two questions are coming up. Hopefully I'm not going to forget one of them, but with blockchain, we've actually got an article on it. I didn't write the thing. Somebody else did, but it really explained pretty, it was the first time I ever really started to grasp how blockchain even works. But I think with that kind of a system, like the notary wouldn't even be necessary anymore because the validity of every transaction is because of the, you know, it sets up this permanent record for every single transaction is verified by the agreement of all the other parties involved. And I don't know, I'm not saying it right, but. It has like an audit system, basically. You can see every transaction from beginning to end, but that's the same situation we have now. We have that with uh, recording offices. The problem is recording offices just take anything in. Yeah, so you need, need some way to verify like, this is real. Everybody who's agreeing here is the actual people who are doing it, which I know like, you know, I got face recognition on my phone. I got fingerprint recognition. So it's like, and there's two-factor authorization. There's all kinds of ways that uh, we've found solutions for this that are pretty effective, I think. It's just about applying that to the deed transferring process somehow. Yeah, no, you're right. It's um, like, even when I do stuff on TikTok, right? I use a lot of TikTok to get leads. I double check those leads more than anything else because the amount of people you come in, especially if you go viral, you have to really check those lots or those pieces of land with even more scrutiny just because of my past experience. Like, I'm not going to get ripped off. I'm going to make sure I don't get ripped off if I buy a piece of land somewhere else. I'm going to go through a title company that I'm going to choose for sure. Yeah, it seems like uh, I'm trying to think of things we can say here that will help people who are hearing this and freaking out (laughs) to help them not freak out. And I mean, maybe a little bit of... uh, I'll say anxiety, but you know, just like cautiousness is probably appropriate. Just being aware that like, this is a thing, but it sounds like, you know, first of all, I don't think this is common. This seems like a huge devastating thing. And it is because we've got this situation that we know of and we're talking about, but when you look at all the land deals everywhere, like I have to believe this is still extremely uncommon that people will go to this length or even know how to do it. But even when it does happen, it seems like this would be on like maybe the 10,000 and under 
properties, right? I mean, the ones where buyers actually have cash. And I'm sure any any land investor out there knows if you've ever done a self-closing, most buyers have very little sophistication. Like they don't really understand what a title search is. Like they just kind of accept the deed, which as long as you're a decent person, like that's fine. But it sets up the situation where if a person really wanted to, like they could totally mess with people. No, like you're right. Because a lot of these properties in Lehigh Acres, at least at the time, were under $15,000. So most people from, you know, my experience have at least $10,000 of liquid cash on them, right? A buyers, at least. So if they're selling it for $3,000 and the market value is $15,000, they're like, oh, I just got a deal. I just got to message this person first. And then it even works against them because now the scammers always say, you know, you better hurry up and give me the money because I have all these other different buyers. And then when you go on the Zillow listing, you have like a thousand views of all these saves. So it actually works against the person to do due diligence because they can like, oh, I'm gonna miss out the deal. You know, the old saying, like, it was too good to be true. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Like, and a lot of these situations um, I've been noticing is that the property's way below market value, way below market value. Even a wholesaler wouldn't be able to get these prices. It wouldn't even make sense why anybody will sell it at this price unless, you know, they have like a problem with it, like a probate or, you know, whatever issue you might have. And you're right. It does happen with these small lots in high traffic areas. So if you're in an area like, let's say, Lehigh Acres, Port Charlotte, Cape Coral, that has a lot of volume in sales, that'll be like a breeding ground for them. And like you said, you don't think it's happening everywhere? I don't either. I just think the people, the bad actors are just doing volume because it's easy to do volume because you could do volume selling lots as it is as a person doing it legitimately. If you do it illegitimately and selling to multiple different people, it is very easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if any, if any potential buyer out there is listening to this, it sounds like you've already covered a handful of really good things to watch out for. Like if it's priced way too low, you know, it just looks too good to be true. Then like could very well be. I wonder if there's like certain steps they could go through to verify the identity of the person selling, like make sure you meet them in person, make sure you see their driver's license. And even that is not perfect, but it's better. You know, it's, it's an extra hoop that they would have to jump through to really bend over backwards to lie to you. The biggest takeaway is check their number on white pages or something or familynow.com is a good, it's like for ancestry, but you could find people on there and it has pretty good phone numbers on there. They're pretty accurate. So white pages, true people search or familynow.com to verify the phone number you're texting is legitimate. Check the age. If it's on Facebook, check the age of the Facebook oh, yeah. profile. That's a good one. If it's, yeah, if it's too young, obviously, like if it's less than a year, you know, red flag, get your own title company. To buy a property. I don't do self-closings anymore. Um, I used to, but make sure you have your own title company that you already vetted before. <laughs> so like a fake one, like these people, unfortunately, it, it was very professional. I can see why people fell for it. It's extremely professional. The way they talk to you, they already knew every question I, you would ask them. So you're going to make sure you have a legitimate title company. Even if you have to pay for it, if it's a small deal or a small like amount, it's worth it. Just for peace of mind. And then if there's anything pops up, the title company's going to tell you. And most times they don't will charge you if it's a red flag. So verify the person, use white pages to verify the number, match it up, match it up with the deed, match up the person who they tell you with the deed. And most recording offices let you like look at the deeds, at least for properties. And if it's a seller on my end, put a sign on the property, always put a sign and put it on um, Zillow for sell by owner to come, all these different websites to make sure you don't get scammed. And I think this is very more, it's more applicable to high volume areas if you buy and sell them. Yeah. And as a seller, I mean, if you were to just say, well, I'm only going to go after properties that are going to sell for, I don't know, 30 grand or higher. Like, do you think it, you'd probably get a lot less of this, like even the chance of it happening or, or could it still just happen? Probably way less. It has to be because all these people are getting very uns unsophisticated investors. The person who contacted me, the first time, the one who went through all those hoops to find my number, very sophisticated investor. He knew what he was doing because I don't know how he got my number. It wasn't even my number that I used to sell properties. It was my the number I used to buy properties. He got it somehow. He got in contact with me and he made me aware of the situation. These scammers do it to people who have very little money, very unsophisticated, only do one or two real estate transactions a year or in their life. And it's very easy if you don't have any experience to get scammed. It's not the people's fault either. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the perfect scam, honestly. Yeah. There, there's one in American Greed that they were doing something similar like in 
um, Central Florida, like in the 90s, they're just making fake deeds and selling properties. And back then, it must have been super easy. I think this is actually, uh, I've heard stories of this happening in other countries. Like it's just like commonplace to the point that it's like risky to own property there at all. Because like you just never know when is your property going to get sold off from under you, you know, or when is the government going to just take it over? It's just crazy. Like what can happen? And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people want to own land in the U.S. is because like we've got a government and law system that really respects property rights and that kind of thing. But this this seems like it kind of undermines that when this kind of stuff can happen so easily. It would be interesting to talk to, I don't know how many attorneys out there have dealt with cases like this of like a fraudulent deed was made and transferred. Like what now? What does that property owner do to get that property back? And You have to do a quiet title. I'm not a legal professional at all, but because I actually, somebody, unfortunately, they, I don't know why, but they made a wrong legal description and I was the owner now, even though I never bought it, it was supposed to, somebody else was supposed to buy it, but they put a legal description of a property I own. It was like a big mix up. Well, basically, they're going to do quiet title to resolve that. But I just signed it off to them. It's not my property. So I just, whatever deed I have to sign, I just signed it off on them. But if I didn't want to do that, they want to do quiet title for a property under like $15,000. At least this lawyer was going to charge $5,000 for that quiet title. But I just gave it to them. Quiet title in the state of Florida. Um, and I'm also now like a legal professional just giving you my experience of what happened when somebody made a incorrect deed. Yeah, I know the quiet title, it's generally the the remedy for a lot of different things. Like not just this, but like, you know, there's a, some cloud from back when or a tax deed sale or something like that that can basically, I believe you have to do an individual one for each individual issue. It's not like one can like fix all problems. But I, I keep thinking about like the person who thought they bought the property. And honestly, like they had every reason to believe it because everything was there. Like the deed was right. The signature was there. The notary was there. Like, is it really their fault? Like, where's their, where's their recourse? <laughs> no, I, I feel, I do feel bad for those people because even if they do buy it and if they're not the first person on the title history, it, it puts a cloud on title regardless. So they, they say they did buy it and they, they can't really do anything with the land now because it's cloud on title. So it's very unfortunate for people who buy land that has been scammed. Like I said before, like on my TikTok, I get leads in. And those, I make sure the person's the right person. Because I think I got a couple of scammy people on there before already. Now, with my experience, I could tell them right away. Like their name doesn't even line up with the deed on the property. The name they're giving me. It's a very small property in the middle of nowhere. Like one of them in Arkansas. I don't know if she was a scammer, but everything showed red flags. The number she gave me, I think it was a Google Voice number. It's a very small lot in the middle of nowhere. Her name wasn't even on the deed. She was giving all these weird excuses. I'm like, I'm out. I'm just not going to contact this person again. Yeah, it's like if you really understand, uh, and I guess it's a good reason to understand how to do a title search and just understand the mechanics of like, and I'm this way too, for the most part. Like if I ever have a chance, everything's going through a title company. Not only because they're going to do a better job and they're on the hook to verify everything, but like they save me a ton of time. I don't have to do this stuff anyway, but but even so, like there is some benefit to actually going through the process and learning how to do a title search yourself, just to understand like, why is it a problem? Like, why do the dots need to connect? And how do you spot issues here and there? Because, you know, like we talked about earlier, most buyers understandably have no idea because they have no reason to understand it. It's, it's confusing and they do it once or twice in their life. So it's just way easier to just fork over money and trust the person, especially if they have a great website and they sound good. And I would even add on that, and say that if you do a title search, you could find out if a property is worth it or not. For example, if you never did a title search, you're not going to figure out that, oh, this property might need a probate because the person signing the agreement is not this person on the deed. Let's say they have the last name. Like, okay, let me go ask them if that's their mother who passed away or the father who passed away. And then if you did title searches on your own, you could figure out problems before you get into them. Because if they, for example, that example, they really can't sign it off. So the thing that's been happening a lot in the state of Florida, a lot of sellers are backing out because you get so many offers, the sellers back out. But if they didn't sign their name, they signed their name and the property is owned by their mother and they never did probate, they don't actually have legal recourse to sell the property at all. Their contract's not even valid, right? So as soon as they get a better offer, they just go with the other person, even though you pay for the probate. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So they could just go around and like, oh, I didn't, the contract wasn't valid. I'm just going to go with somebody else after you pay for the probate and did all the work. Yeah. 
if there's earnest money on the line, does that change anything in terms of like, no, you have to stick with me now because I paid you money and now it's ironclad. I don't think a title company would take it because their name's on, you know, there's not a real contract because they don't own the property. We have to go through either um, some administration or probate to release the property to uh, the heirs. Yeah, it's true. It's a good point. Yeah. So that's a good thing to know if you do sell closings you'll get those experiences that you probably wouldn't know about because the title company is going to tell you about them and you never really worked them out yourself. Yeah. Man, what a mess. I feel like this is an area that is going to evolve and improve in the future because it has to. And uh, I don't know, this will be something just to pay attention to, not only from a buyer and a seller's perspective of just being aware of like how you can get taken advantage of, but also just I'm curious to see like what uh, safeguards will develop in the future. Like maybe this whole notification system that should probably be like standard, a normal thing that every, I don't know why you wouldn't, you know, like it's, and maybe it is, I haven't really looked into it much, but. I think it's because the, the arbitrage between these recording offices are analog. These guys are like 20, 30 years in the future already. So these systems aren't, unless you're in accounting with a lot of volume that they give those services, I think those services sh- should be standard automatically to if anything on the title changes, you can get a notification. And if your email changes, you got to update your email. I think they should like as soon as recording to get your email to automatically give those updates to opt in. Obviously, if you want to opt out from those emails, I don't know why anybody would, but it'll give you access to opt out and opt in. I think they should automatically opt you in. Make sure your property doesn't get in sold by some person using my name or something. Yeah, I mean, basically whatever uh, credit card companies are doing and banks to like protect their own people from fraud and stuff. Like, I don't know, maybe there's some, some notes the real estate world can take from that. Like, Hey, whatever they're doing, figure that out and do that over here because it's working for them. I think it's also dependent on the County too, how much the County has. Like if you're in a really rural County, like in Tennessee or something, it barely doesn't even have a courthouse. You just have like a, I remember this one guy telling me, we don't even have a courthouse. We just have a computer in a room that records everything in that computer. If it goes out, you know, everybody's screwed. <laughs> so I think it's going to get more rapid in those rural states that don't have any kind of, you got like one person doing all the recordings for the entire. So that like little rural County gets more people to move in. It's going to be rapid. It's happening more here. I think because of that same situation, the market started going hot. All these people from New York are buying properties. A lot of scammers from Miami saw a really good opportunity. Yeah. Not that my ideas matter at all, but just, thinking out loud, trying to ideate and think of ways. So like when I think of like a notary, you know, a lot of times like that notary stamp, like that's important for some reason, like that means something or like just putting their name and their uh, expiration date of their, um, their notary bond or whatever that is. I wonder if we could replace that with maybe like, instead of just like a stamp with their name on it, it's like a QR code or like a, a, a barcode or maybe like a, a device that creates a new unique QR code for every single thing they do. So, and it's only linked to that one person who has this, I don't know, it's just- No, that's actually a really good idea. It's kind of what I was talking about earlier, something that basically verifies that this notary actually met with this person and this is going to be tied to them. Yeah, like no other person is capable of generating this- barcode so like we know it's this person because they had to like sign into two places to be to do i don't know just to piggyback off that point a lot of notarizations are happening online so that's an other thing that these scammers if you could do it online these scammers are gonna have a field day because you could just make fake ids because basically i've done online notary notarization before you just take a picture of your id you send it to them you give another picture like two forms of identification you know you have to be a u.s citizen yeah, that's easy to do with a scammer who was experienced doing other stuff. Well, I know there's, uh, I haven't used it myself, but there's like notary cam, if that's still even around. There, there's, what I, th- I think you got to do is like get on a, uh, like a Zoom call. So they're like seeing you and yeah, I'm sure you're right though. I mean, there's even like deep fake technology now where like I can make my face look like Tom Cruise if I want to. I wouldn't have to change much because I'm already that handsome, but somebody like somebody <laughs> like me could you know, do that and yeah. get away with being Tom Cruise or whoever you want to be. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, that's another thing. Like those deep fake things, like they're not even that expensive anymore. There's like, I've seen on AppZumo, they're doing deep fakes of people. Like you're actually the person, you just give them a prompt, a couple of words you say, and they'll get automatically talk like you. And it doesn't even matter if you need to talk to them. You just got to look like them. You can make a fake ID, do a deep fake, and I, what I've noticed when I've done a lot of online notaries is like the picture quality is horrible. So they, even if you do a deep fake, they're not going to be able to tell. 
this whole thing has been like I remember when I, it was happening to me. Oh, like oh, stressing out every single day. There's another person calling me. I'm like, oh, these guys are really good marketers. Like they're really killing it because I'm over here stressed out. Yeah, well, it's totally not your fault. It's like it's not right that you have to get stressed out about this. But if this happened to me, like I'm one who's super concerned about my reputation and what people think about me. If I saw that somebody was dragging my name through the mud, like hurting people badly using my name like that, that would deeply trouble me. Like, I, And especially when it's like, what do you do? Like, how do you stop these people? They're just like running rampant, like dragging your name through the mud. And it's, that would really bother me. So I'm sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, the, the, that's actually kind of one of my concerns. I'm like, man, if these people go to the Better Business Bureau, I'm done. You know, I just started my company. I just barely even got the, you know, the, the letter because of like the, my business has been longer than three years old. And I just made my reputation here in, in this little area with all these different title companies. And if my name get run through the mud and you put me on the news or something, even if I do try to sell legitimately and I have a good name, it still hurts you. It still hurts you. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate your willingness to share what's uh, what happened and how this all came about. You've mentioned uh, TikTok a few times. So how is it that you're using TikTok in your land business? Yeah, that actually started doing it because I saw other people in the land business do it. Basically, I just, you have to be very consistent in making content. At first, I did it to sell land, but I was selling little vacant lots and nobody wants to buy vacant lots. Everybody wants to buy like nice 100 acres or whatever. So I was doing it and I started making content, like making very short content with, within 15 seconds of like three things you need to know before you buy vacant land. Make sure it's not a flood zone. Make sure clear chain of title. Well, very simple things, but for the average consumer, wouldn't know stuff like that. Make sure there's no endangered animals like here in Southwest Florida. So I'll just make little bit bites its pieces. And sometimes I'll go viral. So I'm like, you know what? If I'm going viral, I just put my website in the very end of every TikTok. So I'll, I'll give 80% content, 20% advertisement. So I'll give the three things that you say to look out before you pass, buy a piece of land. And I'll say in the very end, if you want to buy land, go to my website here. And then it was working for a bit. I was getting a whole bunch of views on my website, my, my selling website. On the reverse, I'm like, you know what? I could do this for my buying website because I'm just going to get all this traffic for free. And why not use it for there? Because actually, I could sell land easy now. Land, selling land is not that hard. You just get a realtor. The hard part is getting acquisitions, especially in this kind of market. So I have a buying site and I just basically do the same thing because in TikTok, every video is new to a person. So like, even though they follow you because it goes to a for you page, it's very different algorithm than Instagram. Because if you do two different websites on Instagram, your consumers, your brand is going to be like, wait, it's kind of weird that you have two different websites. But for mine, for TikTok, every video has its own life. It's not really connected to your profile. It'll push it out to similar people that like that kind of stuff in your profile, but not necessarily. Like if you look at the analytics, only like 1% of the people who watch your videos are actually your followers. 99% are from random people you don't even know. Like they have never even followed you or never even seen your stuff. So I started pushing out that same content, but for my buying website, and I've been seeing pretty good results. Like I went viral like a month ago, got like 650,000 views, got 51 leads from that. And you had to go to my website and fill out the form and everything. And I got 50 leads from that. Not all of them are good, but I bought one of them out of all those. And this was, this was just, there's nothing special about this video, right? Like you just, nothing one of special. many you made. And for some reason it went viral. Do you know why it went viral? I think because I'm providing content that people like argue about. I think it was the top areas that have the low, um, they have no income tax, something like that. States that have no income tax, you should buy land at, right? I should have said property tax because more people care about that. And all these people start arguing like, no, no, don't come to Texas. We have you know really high property taxes, or don't come to this state because we have too many people. But people start arguing it, but and then it became viral. Yeah, I got you because all the comments and stuff. Yeah, like it's like it's kind of similar to Facebook, Instagram. The more people comment or respond, it gets more engaging, and the longer people stay on it. And TikTok is like YouTube, but YouTube you have to have at least like what ten minutes, and then they'll, they'll work for you. But in TikTok, let's say you have a fifteen second video. They want you, the, your user, to at least watch 90% of it, and then they'll push out to more people. So I kind of figured out their algorithm, and I liked it that anything can become viral. On Instagram and Facebook, they don't want your stuff to become viral because 
you're going to get, you're going to be competing with their ads. Like uh, the perfect analogy was like, if Beyonce has a hundred million viewers and she posts something and all hundred million view, people can see it. What's the point of going to Facebook to buy ads? You could just go to like a Beyonce and go to somebody else on TikTok. It's exactly like that. If somebody makes a content and they're famous and could push it out, all 1 million people are going to see it. So I think TikTok is a better one to market towards. It's the fastest growing social media. I got on early when it was easier to get viral. Now it's a little bit more difficult. They're making it more and more difficult because obviously they're trying to push their ads now, right? And if you're, if your content and your viewers compete with their ads, they're going to throttle you for sure. So, um, and they're also the most strict in terms of what you can say, what you could do and all that. But I've been getting pretty good results. I bought one piece of land from TikTok. I got like 25,000 followers, which is not that much, but the followers don't really matter is the kind of content you provide. Something with really good hooks and something with that keeps your audience either entertained or informed. Interesting. So you have two different uh, handles, one for buying and one for selling, or they're both all in one? No, it isn't the same handle. Okay. What's your handle? If you want to check it out, what, how do they do that? Oh, landpoint.com. Yeah, the landpoint.com. I just literally made it my website. So when people go on there, you just go to, if you look at my profile, they see my website name. They just automatically go to my website. Because if you put a website now, it wasn't this the case before, but if you put a website in your TikTok, like the actual website, they throw it because you're taking them away from TikTok. So I just put my handle, my TikTok name, my URL for my, my, my selling site to make it easier for more people to go there. Like you put it in the video itself? No, I put it in my actual handle. My handle is thelandpoint.com. Oh, 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 I got you. I got you. I follow you now. Okay. That's a good idea. Because why would if they're going to throttle me for posting on the video, they're going to go to my video, watch similar videos. And then they also throttle it. If you say, click the link in the bio, they don't push it out as more because they know you're going to take them away from TikTok. So I just put it in the, in the handle. It makes, a lot, it makes it easier for everybody. So is it more effective for you to m- try to find buyers or sellers or like? Oh, buyers for sure. It's not even close because there's so many more buyers and sellers. So the thing I do is I send them to my, let's say my buying website. Like if you want to buy land, go to landpoint.com. They all go to landpoint.com. And then as soon as they're, I think the good idea that I have that I did early is I put a pop-up. So before you go to my website, you have to put your email. I got so many buyer emails. I got like 5,000 buyer emails from that. Not all of them are good. That's a lot though. Holy cow. Yeah, just from doing that. Not all of them are going to be good. But then I ask follow-up questions. Are you going to buy financing or pay cash? What state you want to buy in? Because now I have all these people who are cash buyers. And I also ask them the budget. So let's say I have a property in Georgia and a person's budget was within my budget. And I, let's say I don't want to do owner financing. I just want cash. I could just filter the people and send those people emails instead of all my entire my entire group. I got like 5,000 roughly around from TikTok alone. Has this, I mean, just in terms of the amount of leads you get from both sides, like, is it to the point where it can replace direct mail or not really? Not really, not right now. And that's all the thing. Direct mail is very passive. This is going to be very active. I think it replaces, if you're really good at it, Google ads for sure, like, or Facebook ads. I don't know. I think Google ads are, are still worth it. But Facebook ads, for sure, it could replace it. Because Facebook ads, they throw them. Even if you pay for it, you know, you have to have enough of an algorithm. But the cool thing about the getting these free emails of people who want to buy land, these people give you your emails that are most likely going to be connected to their Facebook profile. So you can make lookalike audiences based off the emails that you got based in the states they tell you. So let's say you have a, like the same example. Let's say you have a property in Georgia you want to sell. You send them an email, but then make a lookalike audience of all the cash buyers in that, in that state. Because a lot of people spend a lot of money just to make, just to get enough data to make an audience to put out. I already have the audience. I already have all these people who want to buy cash. I could just put it on Facebook if I wanted to do that and make a lookalike audience to do Facebook ads. Gotcha. Do the videos that you make on TikTok, are those like evergreen in nature? Or like you have to constantly be making more videos all the time where people are going to never see you again? You have to keep on, you have to be consistent. If you're not consistent on TikTok, but the thing is, because I live in the country, I literally just go outside and say, top three websites to buy land or three things you need to look out for buying land. It takes me, at this point, I'm a little bit more seasoned. It takes me literally 15 minutes to make a video. Not all of them are going to go viral, but if they're over 5,000 viewers, I'm happy. 
If they're not, I gotta like adjust my content. But I just go outside, take 15 minute video. Like it takes me 15 minutes to edit it, do all the little things I need to do with it. But it's not that difficult. It's kind of like a you know like brushing your teeth almost at this point. And this can all be done just on your phone, right? You don't even need a computer. You could yeah, you could do it on a computer if you want to make better content, longer form content. You could do it, but you have to have a hook. You have to catch people. I think if you're starting out, you want to make shorter form content, build some type of audience or TikTok, uh, at least make an algorithm to make your audience. And then you can start going longer and longer and longer to make a longer form content. At first, you definitely want to start within 15 seconds, make something engaging with a hook in the very beginning to get, you know, at least a following. So a TikTok could figure out what kind of users are going to like your kind of stuff. Those videos can be up to three minutes long. Is that right? Up to 10 minutes long. If you have like, yeah, now 10, I think it's 10. Don't quote me, but I think it's 10. But to be honest, I should never, you should never do a 10 minute video because most people on TikTok, I've seen it happen to me too, because I watch a lot of videos to see any trends. And most people, attention spans less than 30 seconds. I think TikTok, if you know how to make consistent content about land, which is very difficult, it, it could be worth it for sure. I'm now, I'm, because I'm running out of content to make for land, I'm kind of going to other real estate aspects now. And I'm also like like homesteading stuff as well, which is kind of a similar audience. Yeah. I'm like the same man. Yeah. I kind of discuss homesteading stuff because then they'll go to my profile to look at the stuff I'm talking about homesteading, but then they see I sell land, which is it's kind of like very symbiotic customer bases. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Tell me you're going to do a 15 second video promoting this podcast episode when it goes live. You're going to do that, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> I'll definitely put it. I don't have a YouTube. I'll put your YouTube on mine. I don't really care. Sweet, man. Appreciate it. So I guess to kind of wrap this up, so we covered some TikTok stuff, which I wasn't even really expecting to go into, but you just gave us some really valuable insight on that. So thanks. But just circling back to the whole fraud situation. So I guess I don't want people to worry. You know, I don't don't want people to have anxiety attacks and lose sleep over, you know, my property is going to get stolen from under me. I'm going to get my name trashed by some scammer. But like the reality is this can happen. This is a real thing in this fallen world that we live in. And um, what I want people to take away from this is just be aware of what's going on out there and what can happen. doesn't mean you have to like constantly monitor everything, but you know, if your county will it let you set up notifications, do it, you know, like make sure that you're aware of what's going on. If you're dealing with a property that's sort of lower end in nature, like just a cheaper property, just kind of know that if there was ever a target property for that, that's kind of what they would most likely go for as opposed to like a hundred thousand dollar property or something like that. And on the end of buyers, just same kind of thing. Like just be aware that this kind of stuff can happen. Like verify the identity of the person is selling and use a title company that you choose. And um, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. That doesn't mean that like everybody's out there to scam you because they're totally not. In fact, the vast majority of people are not. But knowing that there are thieves out there, I mean, that's why we have locks on our doors, you know, like use what you can to protect yourself and be careful. So do you have another input to share on that whole situation? Yeah, just to give a little bit more color, like low value properties in hot areas for sure. And always be aware of sell by owners on Zillow. You have to be wary of them, right? Like I said before, check, use white pages or check the number to match the person and check the deed and the person's name, right? If they're not a very sophisticated scammer, they might not even change the name of the deed. They could say I'm John Smith, but then Nancy Drew is on the deed. So I think if you just do your due diligence, if you have $10,000, to spend on a piece of property, you don't want to lose that. There's a lot of people saving these right there. Make sure you do your due diligence. Just don't go in head first in shallow water. But yeah, thank you, by the way. I always enjoyed your content. You're you're kind of, I just wanted to tell you before you go, you're the person who got me into land, honestly. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah, because I remember I was working a nine to five and I was like every lunch, instead of eating lunch, I would eat like a quick lunch and read a bigger pockets. And then I saw your podcast with bigger pockets a long time ago i did finance i'm like yeah lens so much better like i don't know why people don't do it like the, the money makes sense and you don't have to deal with many people yeah totally that's awesome man it's great to hear thanks for letting me know that it's really encouraging <laughs> yeah thank you sounds like you're getting pretty far <laughs> yeah nice job cool well, thanks again Eloy. and again it's uh the landpoint.com right yeah that's my sign site but if you really want to know how to like do like the buying site just copy my format. I do at landforcashmoney.com. 
that's my buying side. And the way I do it there, it's almost the same as my, my selling site, but it's a lot more straightforward. Basically, you don't have to go into too many things. They just basically go in, submit their property, they're done. The more touch points people have to go through, the less likely they're going to actually get people who are, want to sell the property. You want to make it as easy as possible for those kind of people. Gotcha. Thanks for sharing that as well. Sounds like you got some good stuff figured out there. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. So there you go. That was my conversation with Eloy. And as I alluded to at the very beginning of this episode, there was actually an arrest made in connection with this incident that Eloy had to go through. So apparently this scammer had created a bunch of fake purchase agreements and used a DocuSign like system to send these purchase agreements to potential victims. And uh, something that uh, I thought was obvious, but apparently this scammer didn't know it. Systems like DocuSign or PandaDoc or something similar, the whole reason this software can be used to get legally binding electronic signatures is because they track the IP address and the geolocation of everybody who signs documents through their system. It's part of the security that makes these signatures legally binding because they can actually verify that the right person did actually sign the document and where they were when they did it. And uh, I'm definitely not an expert on this, but, uh, you know, as I just look at the way this case played out and the way that uh, notary s signatures currently work, it almost seems like these electronic signature services might be more secure than a notary signature because they can actually track locations and timestamps and all this stuff. But anyway, that's just a side note. Apparently, this scammer was a 20 year old female and she had duped 45 people involving over 20 properties in six different Southwest Florida counties. So it sounds like this person was apparently very smart and this was a pretty widespread thing. She basically tricked the victims into paying over $300,000 for housing that they never received. So it doesn't sound like this was all just with land. Eloy's property just happened to get caught up in this whole scam. And she impersonated owners, created fake title companies and websites and unique email addresses and acted as the closing agent to get the money from the victims. And she effectively did a really good job at making these sales look real. And she's currently facing charges of scheming to defraud, money laundering and aggravated white collar crime, along with communications fraud. And she's currently in jail as of the date of this recording. Eloy told me that the estimated damage was around 300,000, similar to what the local news reported on there, but it could be up to 500,000 by the time everything is accounted for. And I guess that's still in the process of being done. There's actually a local news station that covered all the stuff, which I can link to in the show notes at retipster.com forward slash 134. If you want to check it out, there's a short video just kind of explaining some of the basics that I just covered here. And as we mentioned in the interview, it sounds like there's at least a few different versions of this kind of scam. In some cases, people are making up fake quit claim deeds and recording them, which I'm sure really makes a mess because then it screws up the chain of title and you probably have to do some kind of court action to undo it. And whoever the victim buyer is, obviously it takes a huge hit in that process. And in other cases, like in Eloy's deal, they don't record deeds at all. They just collect money under the guise of a fake title company. And I know we kind of covered this in the interview, but just to kind of wrap this up, what are some things you can do about this? How can you protect yourself? What are some of the red flags you can watch out for if you're ever concerned about this happening to you? Well, again, this is kind of review, but I'll just hit these bullet points again. First of all, if the county that your properties are located in have any kind of notification system that you can sign up for and get emailed or texted whenever something happens to the title of your property, sign up for it. And I actually learned apparently there's services out there like one in particular is called Home Title Lock which can protect you from title fraud. And I have no firsthand experience with this particular service or anything like it, but it's probably worth investigating if you have reason to be concerned about this. From what I can tell, it's basically designed precisely for this kind of situation to protect a property owner in that kind of scenario. And also use a digital signature service like DocuSign or PandaDoc for all legal signatures. Like, for example, a purchase agreement. When you get things started with a new buyer or seller, this is precisely what caught the scammer in Eloy's story when Eloy actually provided this information to the police. And that was part of what they used to catch this person. So even if nothing else is done right, 
this kind of tracking mechanism could be kind of like your last line of defense, just in terms of figuring out who is this other person and where are they if they're not who they say they are. I'm not sure that it would necessarily tell you who they are, but it would at least track where they were when they signed the thing. And also, by the way, we do have affiliate links to a lot of these tools that I'm mentioning here. If you're not already using them and you want to support RE Tipsure when you sign up, you can find those affiliate links in the show notes. Again, retipsure.com forward slash 134. And uh, assuming you're using a title company when you buy or sell a property, like Eloy mentioned, make sure you are the person who chooses that title company. Don't just use whatever title company is suggested to you by the other party. It's usually going to be pretty rare that somebody else is going to insist on you using a particular title company because they all kind of do the same thing. It doesn't really matter as long as they're somewhat competent and move the process along. So in a lot of cases, I don't think you're going to find a strong preference on this. It's just an easy opportunity for you to make sure it's going through the title company that you know and trust. And uh, if you're communicating with somebody on Facebook, say if that's the first way that you're connecting with them, you could check and see if the age of that Facebook profile is under a year old. If it is, it might be kind of a red flag. It doesn't automatically mean that they're a scammer or have ill intent, but, you know, just one of the many things you could look out for. And if you are a land flipper and your intent is to resell that property as soon as possible, you might as well get your property listed immediately and just claim that space for that particular property or parcel number or address. And most of all, just be aware that this kind of thing can happen. And if you do catch wind of some weird thing going on with the properties in the market where you're working, don't just brush it off and assume it's nothing. Look into it and make sure nobody's trying to pull a fast one on you. As far as I can tell, this shouldn't really impact the average land flippers acquisition process because a lot of these scammers seem to be getting involved by inserting themselves as a fake owner and then trying to find buyers and sell to them. Whereas when the average land flipper is contacting people in search of motivated sellers to buy their land, we're doing it in a way that's essentially unsolicited. Like they're not asking for us to reach out to them. We are reaching out to them sort of unprovoked in most cases. So in most cases, these kinds of motivated sellers would have no reason to lie about who they are in the first place. So anyway, I hope you guys found this at least somewhat informative. Hopefully you can walk away from this being smarter and more astute about the things going on out there. Hopefully these systems that a lot of counties throughout the U.S. are using to record documents and get signatures, which is, is frankly just a really old antiquated system, Hopefully this will continue to evolve and we'll get a lot better technology going here. Stuff that is a lot less prone to these kinds of scam attacks, which again are not common, but they can happen. So I'm hopeful we're going to see some of that in the years ahead. Although honestly, I'm not uh, super optimistic about how fast that's going to happen, just given how most counties and governments work in the first place. But I mean, if this kind of scam activity continues to happen in any shape or form, I'm hopeful that that will kind of just sound some alarm bells and get people to realize, hey, something's got to be done. Something needs to change about how we handle this process. But in the meantime, just want to make sure everybody out there is aware of this kind of thing. And I hope it never happens to you. But if it ever does, now you'll be a little bit smarter about how to identify those things and what to do about it. So thanks again for listening. Again, show notes at retipster.com forward slash 134. And I'll talk to you again in the next episode. 